Hey there, welcome to the podcast. My name's Kevin, and you are listening to Can't Make This Up. Uh, I'm really excited about today's episode. Uh, My guest, Dr. Janina Ramirez, uh, is an Oxford historian, and she joins me to talk about her new book called Femina, A New History of the Middle Ages as Told from the Women Who Were Written Out of It. Um, The Middle Ages is such a really fun and interesting part of history uh, that we've unfortunately only gotten into a couple times on this podcast. Uh, It's definitely something we'll have to do more. Uh, But uh, as you'll see uh, with my conversation with Janina, um, you know, she brings such a breadth of knowledge and just a lot of energy uh, for these stories of these really inspiring and powerful women who've had their stories either forgotten or scrubbed from the record. Um, I think that this book has a lot to say for today uh, and has a lot to say about how we understand um, uh, women and other minority groups in history. Uh, and, and it's definitely kind of a reframing of, of who these people were and their role in history. Uh, so I really like that. I, I think it's a fresh take on, uh, on a really interesting period. So I hope that you'll enjoy this conversation. Without further ado, my guest, Janina Ramirez. The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast. Bringing you strange but true from the past it's not the average history that you learned in school we're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools and stories that are just too crazy to believe the stranger than fiction and super unique janina ramirez welcome to the podcast Oh, it is an absolute delight to join you. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I'm super excited to uh, to have you because we haven't done as much uh, medieval history as I would like. So I'm I'm super excited to to dive into your work today. Excellent. Well, hopefully I'll be giving you a slightly different angle on the medieval period as well. We're going to yeah, go so. in through the women and see what we can find by doing that. <laughs> All right. Well, before we dive into it, uh, tell us a little bit about about yourself and your research interests. Well, I am a uh, lecturer at Oxford University. I specialise in um, medieval studies, but uh, I tend to take that in the direction of cultural studies. So visual culture, you know, the idea of building up an understanding of the past through artefacts, through objects, through texts, through music. So, um, yeah, I'm I'm a cultural historian. I also make uh, documentaries for the BBC. I uh, am very, very lucky. I get to go around the world to amazing places like Mexico and Norway and um, create these documentaries. Again, I'm trying to do history differently, come at things a slightly different angle each time. Um, And I write. I write fiction and nonfiction for children and for adults, and I'm a mum, so I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> Very you busy do it juggling. all. <laughs> trying to, trying to keep the balls in the air. <laughs> Great. Well, uh, you you've just come out with a with a new book, uh, and it's called uh, Femina: The uh, A New History of the Middle Ages Through the Women Written Out of It. Uh, and so, my first question for you has to deal with your title. Uh, mm. that that title has a very specific meaning. Can you tell us about that that practice and why you chose it for your title? Yeah, it was. Oh, I mean, it, I'm so amazed by how well this book is doing. It's making me so happy. It's it's going around the globe. It's making an impact. I really didn't think that was going to be the case for me. This is a passion project. I've spent years on it. It's academic, you know, it's uh, a third of the book is bibliography and notes, but don't be put off. It just means you finish reading sooner. <laughs> um, but it means it's, it's well researched. It's very, very heavily researched. Careful, careful work has gone into this. Um, the title actually was a, a a light that was sparked for me years ago now. This is um, so my daughter was about two. She's now 11. So this is, this is how long ago we're talking. And I was making a documentary for the BBC about the mystic Julian of Norwich, who writes this incredible work, Revelations of Divine Love. She um, is the first known book written in English by a woman. And she lived in the, at the end of the 14th century um, as an anchoress. She was walled up in a single room for decades of her life. And in this quiet contemplative space, she wrote this 
beautiful, ruminative sort of spider's web of a book. It's just stunning. And it would have been lost um, as so many books by women have been over the years, uh, destroyed, burnt, um, simply ignored really. Um, and what we were trying to do, it, the reason it survived was this group of uh, nuns, young nuns, they were between 18 and 23. They left Britain, they went to um, France and set up a convent. And there they copied out Julian's text and they preserved it. And we were making this program and it was called In Search of the Lost Manuscript. We were trying to see if we could find the original manuscript that Julian herself wrote. And um, and it was a brilliant hour of television. It was a detective story. You know, we were going all over the country, all over France. And we were delving into archives to try and find if we could, if we could you know, source this manuscript. Um, and one of the things I found myself doing was going into a lot of municipal libraries in France. And municipal libraries there are treasure troves that are untapped because um, after the revolution, so many, uh, when all the convents and monasteries were closed down, so many of their collections were just donated or given or seized by the local uh, library and then shoved in their archives and shoved in their collections. And most of them haven't been properly um, documented. We don't really know what's in a lot of them. And I went to this particular library and the archivist there said, um, oh, I've got so many things I want to show you. He was a really sweet, enthusiastic guy. And he's pulling out all these manuscripts. He's pulling out all these uh, records. And I was finding these records across the different libraries. What they are, are basically receipt books for the the titles that are held in the library at any one time. So if you've got a library record from 1730, you've got the lists of all the titles, it tells you what's held there at that time. And then if you can find a library record from 1780, you can then see what titles are missing. Why are they missing? Why have they gone? Why aren't they in the original catalogue? So it's a really good way of seeing what books were being kept hold of, what were treasured, what were important, and what were being destroyed or written out or removed from the library. And often in these, you see it in the British Museum collections as well, you'll find um, a line, you know, if, if a book is no longer in the catalogue, it will be crossed out and there'll be a word there to describe why it's no longer there. So with the burning of books, for example, you would have things like heretical, um, unorthodox, witchcraft, those words appear alongside. But I found this one, and it, was, it said feminine, and it was like, written by a woman. Feminine means women in Latin. That was the annotation to show that this book no longer survived in this collection because it was written by a woman. And that just gave me the sort of, you know, goosebump moments where, and it really galvanized me. It made me think, okay, so this isn't just some uh, accidental process. This is a deliberate reinterpretation of the past through this controlling of texts. And and, it, and you see it time and again in the book, I kind of delve into different ways that women have been written out. It's not always so conscious. It's not always like, right, here's a work, book by a woman, we're gonna burn it because it's written by a woman. Sometimes it's more organic. Sometimes it's that an individual is no longer seen as supporting the state. So in the case of Athelflaed, Lady of the Mercians, she's written out by her own brother, you know, a generation later, because he doesn't want to be superseded in terms of reputation. Then you'll see it happening whereby some books just aren't copied because they're not seen as useful or beneficial to the next generation and their needs. So it's almost like a Darwinian evolution of the species, which text will survive to serve the next generation um and and that was really what I discovered in the writing of this is there's not just one cut and dry oh my god men are all bad and awful and destroyed all women's books it's far far more complex than that uh, but in writing this book I found not just that I was rediscovering women from the medieval past who some of which I didn't know about some of whom many of the readers won't know about I wasn't just finding them I wasn't just finding the worlds in which they live, because that's the other thing I'm doing. I'm not just doing bio you know, biographies of these people. I am placing them into the society to see what they show us. I was also understanding our recent history and our recent, I suppose, manipulation in terms of how over the last few centuries in particular, we have been conditioned by the historians that have gone before, by the writers that have gone before, the intellectuals that have gone before, to see ourselves in certain ways. And this comes down not just to the being women being the second sex, women being in the domestic sphere, but also to our ideas of class, to our ideas of race, to our ideas of identity. You know, we have had those curated for us. And now it's time to critique that and say, well, what happens if we go back? What do we find when we go back to the raw evidence? And it's a different picture. <laughs> Sorry, that was a very long answer. 
<laughs> no, that that was a beautiful answer and, and <laughs> great explanation of just what history is. I mean, when you get into a graduate program, you know, day one, they try to explain to you, you think history is the past, but really yes. it's this curated knowledge base of, uh, you know, a much larger um, subset. Yeah. And, and, and that, that really sinks in where, when... <laughs> you know, what else is out there? Yeah, and I think it never sinks in when you're doing it as an undergraduate, like, oh, yeah, 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 we're being curated, sure. But it's it's when you're shown these stark realities, when you sort of hit upon these these re- these truths, like I, one of the big ones, one of the sort of clangor moments alongside the title was um, this idea, uh, I mean, I had a couple of eureka moments, one of them was in the titles of the chapters, because I had done so much research and there are, I mean, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and giantesses that have gone before. There are extraordinary works on medieval women that are almost encyclopedic, like Henrietta Leisner's Social History of Medieval Women. But in all of these books that have been particularly flourishing after the 60s, you look at the chapter headings and it's always the same. It's always wives, mothers, sisters aunts maybe there's a little chapter on nuns and then others and I just thought I'm not going to do that I'm not going to reduce these women to that aspect of their their life I'm going to show what else they did so I deliberately chose titles like polymaths and scientists spies and outlaws movers and shakers all terms that traditionally when you read a history book you would assume that's referring to men but in each case it's referring to women And the other eureka moment was when I was trying to get to the bottom of why we end up with this very, very clear gender distinction going through the 18th, 19th and 20th century. You know, why do we fall into these patterns? And it originates with Martin Luther. And I found the phrase, the woman's place is in the home, was coined by Martin Luther. And then I started, yes, I know, right, eureka. Um, Then you start to dig a little deeper and you think, okay, because I know these women like Hildegard of Bingham and Marjorie Kemp and and, Athelblad I mentioned already and Burke of Warrior Women. I know these women exist because I found them in my research. But why do we then not know about them? What allowed them to flourish at the time that they did? Well, what it was, of course, is the opposite of what we might assume. It was the Catholic Church. So today we would think of the Catholic Church as the most patriarchal, kind of exclusively male domain. Mm. But there was this opportunity that women grabbed across the Middle Ages, which was, yes, most women will be in the domestic sphere. They'll be having children. They'll be looking after the house. They'll be you know, helping their husbands and families with, with whatever trade it is that they conduct. But then there's this other life choice. And the other life choice was to go to a convent. Now, today we might think, oh, my gosh, you know, you're giving up sex and you're giving up relationships. You're giving up the real world and you're shutting yourself up. And we had this vision of a sort of white space where all these old ladies are walking around chanting. That was not what a medieval monastery was like. It was the universities, the hospitals, the art centers, the music centers, the sort of the vibrant beating heart of creativity in the medieval world. And women could go there. They didn't have to fear death by childbirth. They were in same sex environments and they were given resources. They had books, they had rich um, materials to make things with. They learned about medicine. They learned about, um, you yeah, know, they could read, they could write, they could fill their minds. And that's what stops with the Protestant Reformation because when the monasteries are closed, the male monastics are given the option to become priests, to carry on, you know, within universities, within different set, um, male environments. Whereas Women have no other choice. It's at that point, their only option that's left is to go into the domestic sphere and go to being wives, mothers, aunts. So they really lose their their only avenue to uh, receive an education and and have an intellectual and cultural impact. Bingo. And that's shocking. And then what you see is the doubling down on that that starts to happen as we get into like the 18th, 19th century and you've got industrial industrialization you've got urbanization but also colonialism this idea that you know you're trying to imprint a sense of sophisticated civilized living across the world wherever you (laughs) attack and conquer and that blueprint is based on on classical tradition it's based on the kind of greek approach of women being in the home And that's what gets transported the length and breadth of these empires, that this is where women's place, this is where they should be. And it is so weird when you start to see it from this sort of telescopic way of of looking back. 
and seeing what was there and then what what comes later. And that's where I start the book, actually, because I start the book with the suffragettes and um, in particularly Emily Wilding Davidson. And um, you might know of her. She was the suffragette who at the 1913 Epsom Derby threw herself in well she didn't there's there's very very complicated uh work being done on this what was so remarkable was that the 1913 derby was filmed it was actually recorded on on video and what you see is the first batch of horses come through then there's a little gap and the king's horse anma is in the second batch of horses and as the horse is coming towards the barrier on Tattenham Corner, this figure dives under the white barrier, seems to sort of move around the front of the horse and reach up. And the horse at that point jumps, hits the figure, possibly, we're not sure, but certainly she collapses to the ground, the horse collapses and the rider falls off as well. Um, what happened has been studied multiple times. What it seems is... Was she trying to be a martyr to the cause? Did she want to go out onto that race course and die for the sake of militant suffrage? That's probably not the case. She had two suffragettes banners pinned inside her coat. And it seems like she was trying to reach up and tie one of these banners to the moving horse or offer it to the king's rider. And I I know about this story. You know, it's, it's seared on our imaginations. Her funeral was attended by over 50,000 people and she very quickly galvanized the suffragette movement which had gone a bit off off kilter um the militant actions burning letter boxes destroying artworks you know throwing themselves off buildings those things were um were losing the interest of the public they were losing the affection of the public and emily wilding davidson's death brought about real change in so much as, as soon as world war one is over women do indeed get the vote so she is seen as a key figure and indeed a martyr in the cause but what nobody knows about Emily Wilding Davidson and I found this in a footnote in a footnote is that she was a medievalist and I was thinking well I'm a medievalist <laughs> this is interesting what's going on so I probed a bit deeper she had gone to Oxford to sit her finals in English literature, in, in medieval English literature. But because Oxford didn't allow women to graduate, she left with a full degree, but she wasn't a graduate. Um, and But she carried on writing. She wrote hundreds of letters and articles and poems. And in all of these, she is focusing on the medieval period. And she calls herself Fair Emily after Chaucer's character. Um, and what I think is going on here, and you read it in her work, she believed that there was a time, the medieval period, where women had agency, where women were empowered. And instead of thinking as a suffragette, I'm blazing new ground, I'm doing something that's never been done before, I'm trying to get women's rights in a way that, you know, it's, it, we're creating this in a vacuum, we're moving forward boldly where no one has gone before. That wasn't what the suffragettes were saying at all. They were saying, we want to go back to a time where we had power that has been removed from us relatively recently. And the more I looked, the more I found this as a subtext through the suffragette movement. You know, Joan of Arc is their figurehead, the, the mediev medieval warrior and saint. And many of them were celebrating the medieval period. And so I was sort of thinking, even that bit of our story is wrong. You know, they we say women's rights are 100 years old. Well, that's not what they thought at all. They thought that they had rights that were removed from them. And the more I dig, and I'm very lucky because I work, uh, especially in my television work, I work on a lot of deep history as well. So I've done work on the Minoans, Minoan culture in Crete. I've done work on Chatelhuyak, the world's oldest city. And the further back you go, the more you see these sort of egalitarian equal societies. Chatelhuyak, you know, we're going back 10,000 BC. Uh, that is a society where the skeletal remains show that men and women were eating the same, doing the same work. There was no hierarchy. They were performing the same tasks. And, and that is something that we've just slowly just forgotten. And we assume that this is something that's always been there, that, you know, we've always been weaker. We've always been required to have children and stay indoors. No, even in Neolithic times, male and female skeletons were about the same height and the same build and both hunted and both did all the tasks. And so... Yeah, we've got to challenge all of it. It, it. And actually, when I came to writing my conclusion, the only thing I could write at the end of the book was, I have changed my perspective on the period I thought I knew in the process of writing this book. So much has changed. So much of my understanding has changed. I mean, what else can I say? If I've been changed by it in the process of writing it, then 
it must be doing something <laughs> because I've been studying this stuff for decades, you know? So fingers crossed. Yeah. It's something new. It's a different way of looking. Um, yeah, I think you, I think there's something very special about your book. Um, when, uh, you know, I, I, I got my copy and I'm sitting at home. Um, I noticed my wife's flipping through it and, <laughs> you know, I get all kinds of history books and she didn't, don't even notice them and walk right by them. But this one, she's intrigued by, and even even my nine year old daughter walks over to it and is like, "What's that?" Excellent. This? And you know, she's asking me what it's about, and I'm like, you know, important women in the Middle Ages, and she says, "Oh, like princesses and stuff." Mm. And, I, and I and I go, "No, you know, heroes and warriors and important leaders." And uh, and she, can I read that? And oh she, wow! You know, she's nine. It might be a little above her head, but oh, but I have um, written a book. She can read. I wrote two books in the same year. I wrote a book called Goddess as well, which is fifty okay. female figures that have shaped belief, and it's a global book. And it's um, she'd love that. It's beautifully illustrated by Sarah Walsh, and it's just it's perfect. I, and uh, both my son and daughter adore that Goddess. book, Goddess. Um, <laughs> It took so much research, you know, <laughs> when I talk about, it was supposed to be, I'll oh, just write 50 stories about goddesses that have inspired people across time. And I just said, nope, this is Nina's way of doing things. I'm going to overcomplicate this and make it incredibly <laughs> new and different. And so I decided for the first time to put all the continents in and to work with some of the stories that were actually not even recorded in text, that like oral traditions and, um, you know, Aboriginal people and people that are sort of not recording their texts in the same way as, say, you know, the Greek and Romans were and it became such a hard exercise but my god I was proud of it I was really proud of it so I was working on goddesses at the same time as feminine and I think that was really important I was getting this sort of long form narrative about really the complexity of humanity because I don't see it like goddess feminine and goddess neither of them are sort of bra burning drum beating feminist works they're they're trying to be uh, by putting the frame on women, they're trying to show all of humanity in its complexity and diversity. The fact that women can do all the things that men are doing. You know, when I talk about the Burka warrior woman being this sort of warrior leader, when I talk about um, Hildegarda Bingham being this polymath that sort of rivals Leonardo da Vinci, what I'm trying to sh say is it's not just about looking for the women, it's about looking for everybody that's been sort of excluded from the great man narrative and, and the traditional way of looking to the past. So really, I mean, that's what goddess taught me more, I think, even than Femina, was these women, you'd, you'd assume when you start writing a book about goddesses, it's going to be Venuses, you know, naked women emerging out of shells and stuff like that. <laughs> and it's the opposite. You know, they are what they, they're bloodthirsty, like Carly, you know, they're on the battlefield stomping with passion. You've got, um, yeah, they're monsters. You've got Baba Yaga, the witch in Russian folklore. You've got um, you know, all these layers of complexity. And what they're really showing you is that both men and women have all this capacity to be this full spectrum of identities. And women are you know, put, looking for them because they're the single biggest excluded part of the narrative, you know, over 50% of the popula world's population at any one time. What happens when you frame up on them? Well, lo and behold, everyone else comes into focus. And I still think we're under the thrall of the, of the great man, the great kind of, the old traditional kind of great man narrative. We still, believe it on a almost on a subconscious level I think a lot of the time you know so going back and challenging, yeah totally yeah. yeah yeah we've internalized these things we assume them to be true um and so it's about challenging on quite a deep level I think and yes it's a history book and you know look at me bigging it up as if it's some sort of life-changing thing but but for me I found it really empowering I found discovering this stuff writing it up putting it out there um it really changed my view of things. It, 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 it kind of got me uh, to feel like there's there's something bigger we have to be picking away at here, something sort of more, um, yeah, more insidious, more intrinsic that, that we, we need to talk about. Hi, I hope that you're enjoying this episode from Can't Make This Up. Uh, I wanted to take a short break from our conversation today to tell you uh, about a new little side project that I've started to go alongside of the podcast. Uh, I have opened an Etsy shop called Gifts for History Nerds, where I am creating uh, humorous history-themed coffee mugs and other items uh, using some iconic uh, imagery from history. 
Uh, I hope that you'll check it out. You can find a link to the Etsy shop, Gifts for History Nerds, down in the description of this episode in your podcast app. And then uh, if you peruse the collection and you see something that you like, uh, feel free to enter the promo code CMTUHistory to get 10% off. All right, well now back to uh, my conversation with today's guests. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question that's probably going to be difficult um, because I can tell how much you you love this whole project. But, uh, you know, and you profile a, you know, a number of people. But if you could pick may, maybe like one favorite or or maybe somebody who you weren't familiar with at all and you learned about them in, in the course of this research, um, mm-hmm. you know, who would it be? Oh, this is awful. It's like choosing your favorite child. It's not good. Um, <laughs> I, so I'm going to choose the one that, that spoke to me most closely, but also seems to be speaking to readers. And she comes right at the middle of the book. And I've mentioned her already. She's the polymath Hildegard of Bingham. And um, and what's really interesting about Hildegard is actually, while all the other women I feature have been forgotten, ignored, written out, excluded, Hildegard was never fully forgotten in her homeland of Germany. She was sort of appreciated down the centuries. And so much so that, that her collected works, I mean, who even today gets a collected works put it uh, together during their lifetime but this enormous manuscript the Ryzen codex huge too big to lift you know massive thing it survives the war in the beginning of this chapter I won't spoil it people have to buy the book to read it but it's this amazing kind of wartime detective story of how this book is saved and um I know and in this this collection in this Ryzen codex you have everything that she worked on and this is this is where it gets exciting because she was by no means a one trick pony. She wrote philosophy, theology. She wrote um, political advice and letters to the emperor, to the Pope, to the Kings and Queens of Europe. She was called the prophet of the, of the Rhine. Um, she was, so she was actively involved in those. She ran and, and established two monasteries all from scratch, building works, you know, turning them in the, into these powerhouses of kind of fe- female creativity and expression. But she was also the, a scientist. She's still seen as the mother of the natural histories in Germany. She was a, a medic. She writes about the natural environment, about stones and plants. And, and she wrote music. The most incredible music. If anybody listening to this podcast does one thing after after this, go onto YouTube and download Hildegard of Bingham music and just see how it makes you feel. It is unlike anything because she's writing it for women's voices and she jumps across two octaves sometimes. And it's this, it's almost like Tolkien-esque Lord of the Rings elfish sort of sounding stuff. It's ethereal and it's magical. So she's a musician, a composer. She invents her own language. She's an artist. The front cover of Femina, I think the reason people are kind of walking up to it and go, wow, is it such a beautiful cover? That's her depiction of the cosmic egg. Mm. And, um, and you know, if you see other things in it, because it's probably there too, but the cosmic egg, she sort of describes as this vision of the heavens. And, and she was a, a visionary. She was just extraordinary. And she very fortunately lived to the age of 81. And I think that's one of the things that she had on her side was her longevity. But she is but in this collected works, you hear her voices, her multiple voices. When she's talking about medis- medicine or science, she's very pragmatic, she's very sensible. She's laying out all the ingredients and all, you know, how things have to be done. When she's talking on a visionary level, she's ex- her language is so um rich and textured and cinematic almost you know she's trying to get you to see these things and and then when she's writing to politicians when she's writing to to world leaders she's she's very forceful she's saying this has to be done this is what's wrong with the world you have to fix the world so i in any age hildegarda bingham would be considered extraordinary i can't think of a person alive today that has her range of skills she was trying to probe at existence she was trying to probe at the nature of being alive and how you can get to it through words but words have limitations what if you invent your own language does that get you closer to it what about if you avoid language altogether and you use the art of the hands or you make music or you perform or you dance how can we get to the essence of existence and and I just think what a human being what a human being and she lived nearly a that you know over 800 years ago (laughs) and really unless you read your book or do some type of medieval course Mm -hmm. specifically 
you probably would have never have heard of her. Exactly. And yet, you know, the, the name Leonardo da Vinci rolls off people's tongues left, right and centre. She was better than Leonardo da Vinci before Leonardo da Vinci. And she finished her projects. <laughs> He notoriously did not finish or complete things. So you know, she should roll off our tongue as easily as, as Leonardo da Vinci, but but she doesn't. And again, you know, this is all sort of part of this bigger scheme of post-Reformation recasting of the medieval period. So um, one of the things I wanted to do in the book and why it's called A New History of the Middle Ages is even I have inherited this sort of Monty Python-esque vision <laughs> The medieval period is nasty, brutish, dark, short, you know, peasants in a field piling up mud. Um, you know, it's hard to combat those things. And, and a time of superstition, a, a time of uh, ignorance, you know, widespread ignorance. But that was all propaganda on the part of reformers to cast what had gone before in a certain light. If it was popish, if it was Catholic, if it was Middle Ages, it was not coming forward with us. It was going to be left behind. It was not worthy of bringing bringing into the modern age, into the modern world. But what I've shown in this book is that wasn't really the case. This, there was so many rich, intelligent, brilliant things happening. And yes, they're happening within the this was the loose framework of the Catholic Church. But what you actually see is that people of the past and people of the medieval period were as dissident and as uh, controversial and uh, problematic as we are today. For every one person that's going to church very piously on a Sunday and sticking to their feast days, there's others that don't care. And then there's others who are actively pushing against it and trying to challenge it and change it. So yeah, I think we, myself included, there is a danger when we look backwards of almost being sort of patronising, condescending to the people of the past. They were a simpler, more ignorant version of ourselves today. They weren't. They were us just before us. <laughs> yeah, and they, 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 you know, they had the same feelings and needs and interests and ambitions as us. Um, they didn't have the technology, perhaps, but in other respects, they were constantly pushing, constantly striving. Um, and that really comes through when you look for the women. That's where you really see it. But if you took us and dropped them in their environment, you could expect similar behavior. I don't. Yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, that's the thing. Marjorie Kemp, for example. Yeah, Marjorie Kemp's book. Again, that's sort of coming towards the end. I don't want to give all of the spoilers away because there's there's a lot in the book. But um, Marjorie Kemp, so she's 14th century. And my goodness, she is such a real three-dimensional human being. So again, a bit like Julian of Norwich's Revelations of Divine Love. Her book should not have survived at all. And I start the, the, the chapter with the discovery. It's like Colonel Ignatius Butler Bowden Brown. And he's looking for some ping pong balls. He wants to play ping pong in his stately home. And he goes rummaging in a in a cupboard and he's pulling everything out. It's like, why can't I find any ping pong balls? And he pulls out this dusty old manuscript. And he says to his guest, I'm going to put the whole bloody lot on the barbecue. I'm fed up with it, all this junk that's in here. And the curator that he's actually there with, the guy that he's actually there with is the curator of the Victoria and Albert Museum. And this, this friend says, do you know what? I wouldn't burn them. Just, just let me have a little look. They have a look. And what they find is the first autobiography written in English, written by a woman, Marjorie Kemp. And it's a one-off. <laughs> it's this totally random book. It shouldn't survive. It's so weird. Um, and in it, you get this this screeching voice of this woman who was just so ambitious, so driven. I mean, she's she's sort of annoying at times. You sort of think, God, if I got stuck on a cruise ship with her, I just want to uh, <laughs> jump off the side. But she's like, she's loud and she's garish and she's brave and she's brazen and she talks about sex all the time and she's having in this intimate relationship with Jesus and she's you know she's born again as a virgin even though she's had 15 kids and she's constantly reinventing herself she's this sort of entrepreneurial crazily modern woman she tries her hand at everything she tries setting up a mill that fails she start tries setting up a beer brewing factory that fails and then she reinvents herself as a celebrity as this a celebrity visionary who travels around the world and she travels further than most people would travel in their lifetimes today. You know, she travels from Kings Lynn in England um, down to Santiago de Compostela in Spain. She travels down through Italy. She goes over to Jerusalem. Uh, she goes up to Scandinavia. She goes across Poland. I mean, 
it challenges this assumption that the people of the medieval period were living these parochial kind of never quiet leaving lives. Village. Exactly, living and dying inside of their parish church. I mean, Marjorie blows it all apart and she gives us such intimate details. She talks about things like what it's like to care for her elderly husband as he's losing his mind and you know how she you, what she has to do she doesn't talk about her kids instantly she totally seems to ignore the fact she has all these children but she is building a brand for herself she wants to be this sort of international jet setting mystic that people pay money to support and hear listen to and you know, be celebrated um but actually you know it, it's it's fascinating you delve into these mystics you delve into Hildegard you delve into Marjorie there's always a core incident something that's triggered them to start having these visions so in the case of Hildegard, it's almost certainly migraines. Uh, what she's describing is is very, very much uh, migraines. It's with the sc scotoma, the sort of metallic, sort of radiating, pulsating visions and the colour palette that she uses and the way she, she be experiences them as swelling. So she takes her migraines and sees them as divine and sees them as an opportunity as a woman to talk about God and the divine. So she sort of works it to her favour. And Marjorie's the same. Marjorie actually suffers from postnatal depression. She becomes uh, suicidal, deeply damaged and depressed after the birth of one of her children. And in that sort of state, she starts having these visions of Christ coming to her, Christ being her lover, Christ being her, her partner, um, being there for her. And so then she says, right, well, I'm a visionary. Um, if I'm a visionary, there's other amazingly popular visionaries like St. Bridget of Sweden and Maria of Orignon, they're all they're all legends out there. People are you know, dressing like Bridget. They're dressed, you know, she they were sort of the fashion icons, the cultural icons of the time. So Marjorie says, fine, I'll I'll try my hand at that. I'll be a, a visionary. And and it's it's so amazing to see this, this very, very modern woman juggling everything as well, trying things out, failing, having a go again. It's it's awesome. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, if I could, could, Nina, ask you ask you one more question. Um, uh, before we start our interview, you know, you talked a little bit about the the relevancy of your book today. Uh, what do you hope that readers from your book, wh whether they be, um, you know, older, younger men, women, non-binary, what, what do you hope that they take away from this history? Well, I sort of started in the introduction playing around with this idea that you can't be what you can't see and it's something I've encountered a lot in my television work and media work is that you know when I started 13 years ago there weren't many of us women academics on the screen we were you know, vastly outnumbered by men in suits um, and then over the last 10 years we've seen diversity we've seen, seen people of different abilities and people of different backgrounds and there is a a sort of burgeoning interest in representation, you know, that, that people find themselves. And I want this to be an opportunity for people to find themselves in the past. So, you know, as, as the book progresses, I move on to looking at, at issues of diversity, issues of sexuality in the book, in the latter chapters. Um, and really, I want this to be a book that empowers people because if you've been told that you know, there's someone that's gone before you, someone that's sort of forged the way, someone that did something before you, it can inspire you to think that you're not having to do this in a vacuum. You're not alone. There's somewhere, a context, a, a foundation, a framework for you to, to put yourself into the picture. I felt very alienated studying history at school. I felt the stories weren't, I wasn't in them. I'm a, a woman, an immigrant. I'm, you know, lower class. You, what, what, where am I? It's kings and queens and battles and and um, you know, rich, powerful people making big decisions. Where am I? And all the areas of history that used to be on the periphery, social history, local history, women's history, genealogy. You know, these areas they were always outside of the kind of mother subject of history. They're creeping in and they're influencing our way of looking. And I think it's brilliant because. Yeah, I want to find the many, not the few. I want to find what it was like to be alive at that time in the past and bring it together with all its richness and all its complexity. And through that, I think it is empowering because you see these individuals who've gone before us, who forged their own way, who had agency, who had you know, this space made for them. We could do it again and maybe we can build towards a future that is more equal, but we can't do it if we don't know what's gone before. And I think the other takeaway from the book I'd like is for people to be really critical of what they read. 
um, you know, the reason there's so much apparatus and so much research in this book is because I'm showing it takes detective work, it takes true kind of dense scholarship to find this evidence, but it's there. It just you we have to look for it and we have to look in different ways and we have to critique the the, the versions we've been told and look for ourselves look with our own eyes go back to the raw material go back to the archaeology the the hard evidence that that's where the, the clues lie um and there's a call to arms in this book at the beginning and at the end i say take up the baton you know this is my interest area medieval women what are you interested in? Who lived in your house, maybe? What happened in your village? Go to your libraries, go to your museums, go to your local churches and archives and do it yourself. Find the thing that you're interested in and dig for them. Dig for those people, pull them out of the records, out of the past. Um, and, and it's so much richer, I think, as, as an area of study. And, and so that would be that would be my hope that it, it doesn't just cast the Middle Ages and Middle Age women, medieval women in a different light, but that it's part of a sort of different way of doing history. Uh, you know, as a, as a history person, um, you know, goosebumps here from, from what you just said. <laughs> oh, that's so kind of you. Well, we've all got to sort of shout it off the rooftops. We've got an opportunity for change and and the, the world sits at pivot, a pivotal moment. And if we just keep working towards the sort of broader understanding of, of humanity and, and our, what we are and our, all our complexity and diversity, then I think that that's, that's hopefully you know, a good direction to be pushing pushing our studies. Well, if um, anybody wants to uh, pick up a copy of uh, Fabina or uh, learn more about you, where can they go? Oh, uh, they uh, well, it's out in the US now, so um, it can be purchased, I hope, at all good bookshops, but also available online. Um, learn more about me. I mean, I'm I'm out there. I, there's videos of me and my documentaries, and I do a lot of public talks, both online and in person. So yeah, I'd love to see people at my talks. I'd love to to you know, for people to be interested in in. I do a lot of stuff, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, if you want to hear me talk about Vikings, if you want to hear me talk about um, you know, ancient civilizations, there is there's information out there. Just Google me. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Janina Ramirez, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. Uh, it has been so much fun. I know I've talked endlessly, but um, you're just the most lovely host. Thank you so much for having me. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out for another episode of Can't Make This Up. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed my conversation with Janina uh, and found Femina as, as interesting as I did. I know I definitely learned about some figures uh, that I had frankly never even heard of before. Uh, so if you were intrigued by this and you wanted to pick up a copy of, of Janina's book, uh, there's a link for it down in the description of this episode in, in your podcast app. Uh, that'll take you to a website called bookshop.org, uh, and they'll connect you with your local independent uh, bookseller. Uh, or if audiobooks are more your thing, uh, I've got a link as well uh, to the audio version of, the, of Femina uh, on Libro.fm. Uh, and my understanding is that uh, Janina is the narrator of the audiobook as well. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you to my guests today. Uh, and as we talked about in the, in the show, um, the one figure, Hildegard of Bingen, uh, has this, um, you know, she was a polymath uh, and a composer and, and all these different things. Uh, so I took Janina's advice and looked up her music on, on YouTube, uh, and she does have this just amazing uh, music that uh, I'm sure with the acoustics of a cathedral uh, is just astounding. Uh, so what I've done at the end of this episode is I've included a couple samplings of music from Hildegard of Bingen, and I hope that you'll enjoy it uh, as much as I have. Lastly, uh, if you are a fan of Can't Make This, this Up, uh, if you've listened to a few episodes, um, I encourage you to follow the show on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, whatever you're listening on. Uh, and then if you want to follow along on social media, I'm at CMTU History at uh, TikTok, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, whatever. Uh, and uh, feel free to leave a review as well. Uh, those are really important uh, and they help, you know, whatever the algorithm does uh and then helps you know spread the word about the show to other other humans um 
Lastly, if you want to support the show and get access to episodes before anybody else uh, and get access to bonus Q&A sometimes uh, with my guests, uh, the show has a Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash CMTU history, uh, and that'll give you a chance to support the podcast and, and get some extras as well. Uh, all right. Well, uh, that'll be it for a couple weeks. Uh, I will be talking with Simon Garfield about the history of the encyclopedia and having a little bit of a broader discussion uh, and just kind of the the history of collecting knowledge in general. Uh, But then also uh, I'm talking to Alexander Larman uh, about uh, his book, The Windsors at War, looking at the royal family during World War II. Uh, So a lot of fun things ahead in the spring. Uh, And so I look forward to seeing you guys next time. Take care.